Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. I'm your co-host, Debbie Cox Bolton. Welcome to my very, very lively conversation with Dave Ehrenberg, New Dealer and Palm Beach County, Florida State Attorney. Some of you might know Dave from his appearances as a legal analyst for CNN and MSNBC. And if you do, today's conversation is not going to disappoint. We covered a wide range of topics, from which TV show will tell you all you need to know about the state attorney's job his work to address the opioid crisis, and some of the high-profile cases that have crossed his desk. He also gives his candid assessment of what happened Tuesday and whether Florida is still a swing state at all, as well as his thoughts on the upcoming match between Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump 2024, and his prediction on whether former president will be indicted. I hope you enjoy. All right, Dave Ehrenberg, welcome to an honorable profession. Thanks for having me, Debbie. Great to be on with you. It's so great to see you. And I'm so excited to talk about all things Florida and midterms. But before we get to all of that, I just want to talk about some of the amazing work that you are doing. And I thought I'd start with the fact that you are a state attorney in Palm Beach County, Florida. And for our listeners who are even who are political junkies, I'm not sure everyone knows what a state attorney is. And I thought I'd just ask the, the very basic question of you're elected, obviously, but like what what is what is your job? What do you do? Well, do you ever watch Law and Order? I love Law and Order. <laughs> yeah, I'm the second half of the TV show. I love, I love <laughs> so, that explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, I'm the chief prosecutor in the county, and every county or circuit around the country has one. They usually call a district attorney, the DA. I would rather this job here in Florida be called district attorney because my initials are DA. I, I think about that, DA for DA, but here, DA for SA doesn't quite have the same ring to it. But it's the same thing. In fact, Florida is the only state in the country, because we're Florida, after all, we have to be different, that calls this job state attorney. And I know whenever I say that, my friends in Maryland and Illinois, maybe some other places say, oh, no, we call it state's attorney. But we don't have an apostrophe here. We have no S. We just call it state attorney. And it's just the prosecutor's job, the DA job that we all see on TV or in the news. Bonnie Willis, my counterpart in Holden County, who's investigating Trump. Remember Cy Vance Jr. in New York, now it's Alvin Bragg. It's the same job down here. There are 20 of us in Florida, and we run with a partisan letter, a uh, party. And so I'm a Democrat in a blue county in a red state. Yeah, so much to talk about on that. I, I want to ask you, though, about a couple of things that you've been working on that you've been so great at getting results on, some of which you've gotten real national attention for. One is your work on cracking down on rogue sober homes, which people might not know what that is. And so tell me about what that what that was about and, and kind of what led you into that effort. Back in 2001, when I was an assistant attorney general, I investigated Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin for their marketing practices. I think I was one of the very first in the country to do so. And it's very hard to watch Dope Sick on, uh, on Hulu if you ever see that. It is a amazing uh, docu-series where, I mean, they get it right. I mean, they are spot on as to what happened during the, the beginnings of the opioid epidemic. And so I was there at the front lines at the beginning. And then it became a theme throughout my career uh, as a state senator working on the opioid epidemic. And then later as drug czar for the attorney general, trying to shut down these pill mills, which were these clinics around the country where you had doctors really being drug dealers wearing white coats. And then after I got elected state attorney, I saw that you know you still had all these millions of Americans who were dependent on these opioids and trying to get off them. And they were coming down to my community here in Palm Beach County under false pretenses, a lot of times with a free plane ticket, a one-way ticket. And instead of getting well, they were leaving in an ambulance or a body bag. And the reason was because you had corruption in the drug treatment industry. You had people giving you false promises. 
and they would attract you into rehab here and keep you in a perpetual cycle of relapse instead of recovery because they wanted your insurance benefits. And when you have someone with a brain disease of addiction, you have a willing victim, someone who is going to welcome getting free housing and a stipend and free transportation and a co-ed living arrangement. All are not conducive to a quality recovery. And they would go in and out of recovery, living for free and getting all these benefits until they they died. And it was a, a tragedy. And so that's what we focus on, cleaning up the drug treatment and sober home industries. And we have. Unfortunately, the problem has spread to the rest of the country. And so you have all these corrupted drug treatment and sober homes opening up in other communities where they're not prepared for this issue, where they don't know about what's called the Florida shuffle. But at least in Palm Beach County, we've, we have a roadmap here for other communities to follow because we've succeeded in cleaning the industry up. Yeah, it's amazing. And you have really had amazing results. I think like your opioid overdose death rate dropped significantly, you know, after that you were able to clean this a lot up. So I do hope people take advantage of, of finding out what you did. It's just, it's just heartbreaking to think about these folks had the wrong incentives to essentially keep everybody needing recovery over and over again for their financials to work and just ruining lives. So thank you for all the work that you did. You did on that. I, wa- I wanted to ask you another question. It's so interesting. You said this at the top that you're a Democrat state attorney in a blue city in a red state. Florida is like ground zero for so many complicated and, and heartbreaking from where we sit for the rest of the, the country who are Democrats issues, whether it's choice, whether it's don't say gay, whether it's re- redistricting, which we just saw play out. Like what's the relation? How does it work? Like in terms of how, what's your relationship to some of the statewide legislation gets that gets passed and kind of how does, how does that play out on the ground? Well, you and I knew each other when I was, first I was an intern for the DLC, but also then later as a state senator. And now I'm a recovering politician. I, I don't make the laws anymore. I enforce the laws as state attorney. And so when the state passes abortion restrictions, it's up to us prosecutors, state attorneys, to use our discretion to decide whether to file charges. That's one of the things that got Andrew Warren in hot water with the governor. He's my counterpart in Hillsborough County, Tampa. And he signed on to a letter that said that he opposed additional abortion restrictions after Dobbs and that uh, there should be no enforcement of those instri- restrictions. Now, the governor used that as a pretext to, to suspend Andrew Warren from his job. Andrew's saying there was no controversy before me. There was no case before me. And in fact, the law that was passed by the state legislature, which was a 15-week abortion ban with no exceptions for rape or incest, that is currently held up in the courts. And so he was giving his opinion on it, uh, protected by the First Amendment. So that in itself is going to be litigated in the courts because the governor, DeSantis, suspended Andrew Warren. But in our job, we have discretion over what kinds of cases we prosecute. And We have to follow the evidence and apply the law. If you come out with a blanket statement saying that no matter what the evidence is, I will not prosecute a case, you risk being suspended. And that's going to be the crux of the debate in court between DeSantis and Andrew Warren. I happen to think Andrew Warren should not have been suspended, but I have not signed on to any blanket statements because I I just think I'm going to use my discretion. This is how I answer the question on abortion restrictions or anything else. For example, my record is clear that I support uh, women's reproductive rights. I did it in the state Senate, and I, I believe so strongly now, and I strongly oppose the Dobbs decision. And as state attorney, I will review every matter on a case-by-case basis. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And it's a really important distinction to make that you're not a policymaker, you enforce the law. So I appreciate you you doing that. And how much of, maybe this goes question a little bit goes back to the first thing we're talking about, which, which is the sober homes piece. How much of your job is reactionary when cases are coming before you versus how much do you get to see a problem in your community like sober homes and say, you know what, that's something I'm going to go out and try to fix in my capacity as state attorney? Like, what is, what's that balance look like? Debbie, it's a great question. You've clearly done this before. <laughs> I, love that. <laughs> I love that you said that. Thank you. You and I know each other for years and you've been driven by policy and very innovative. And this is such an important question because prosecutors, it differs in other parts of the country. In our state, prosecutors are more reactive. We are, as I said, the second half of the TV show, Law and Order, where the police are the gatekeepers. And so when people say, well, why aren't you prosecuting Donald Trump? I said, well, 
when the police bring me a, a case file, a, a packet, we'll review it. That's how it is. And there are some exceptions. We have created a task force for the sober homes issue, the drug treatment industry, where we work with police to root out this corruption. And so we move into the first half of the TV show, essentially. We've done this with human trafficking, another one, a problem area. We, we work with police at the front end to develop cases. And before we started these task forces, we didn't have any cases, no human trafficking cases, no drug treatment, sober home corruption cases. And so by moving into the front, we're able to say, hey, we see a problem in the community and we need to work with police to go get it and be aggressive. And you don't do this for a person. You don't say, well, we're going to target Donald Trump and we're going to move to the first half of the TV show. No, no. You have to find an issue that is a clear and present danger that's a problem in the community. And you can create that task force, but it takes resources and a commitment from your prosecutor and money from your office to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. I mean, you do have... You've had a lot of high profile stuff come across your desk, right? You had the Tiger Woods accident back in 2017. You've you Mar a Lago is in Palm Beach County. Jeffrey Epstein's house is in Palm Beach. You've you've had a lot of <laughs> a lot of high yeah. profile stuff. Uh, oh, you how- haven't even mentioned the top two high profile cases I've had. Remind me. And, uh, well, let's see. Uh, we'll we'll start with number two. Corey Lewandowski, Donald Trump's campaign manager who was charged by police for battery during the campaign in 2015 when he grabbed a Breitbart reporter. And it was a huge firestorm. Uh, When I made the decision, uh, the announcement that I was not going to be filing the charges, it was covered live in all the stations. And I thought this is going to be the most publicized thing I'll ever do in my career. And then Robert Kraft (laughs) uh, situation happened. And that was just huge. And on that one, we pursued the charges. But the courts threw out the videos, the secret videos that the police used, saying that the police did not minimize the intrusion on privacy enough. And so as a result, we dropped all the charges. But never a dull day at this job. And I may add, you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein. That was before I ever got here. Yes, that was my office. But that was six years before I became state attorney. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But it's, it's a high profile job. So I mean, how do you balance kind of the, you've just spoken very clear-eyed Lee uh, about kind of your job and what your role is. And I assume that's just how you have to do this job. But like you've got media swarming all around, you know, when, going, wondering if you're going to do this, if you're going to do that. Like, how do you, man, how do you handle all that? How does it work? You have to have a good PIO, <laughs> public information officer, who's able to help take those media calls. And you just have to, well, one thing you benefit from as a prosecutor is that when a case is pending, when an investigation is pending, you are very limited to what you can say. And as a result, you can just answer, hey, it's a pending case. I can't say anything more than discussing what's in the four corners of the probable cause affidavit. And that protects you. And the bad side of that is that as a prosecutor, you're very limited in what you can say. And so when people take shots at you and spread misinformation, you can't really respond. I mean, there, whether it's in the Robert Kraft case or I assume this happened uh, back in the Jeffrey Epstein case when, but that was it. That was different because the criticism came after that was over generally, Right. but you can uh, apply to the Corey Lewandowski case. I was on the cover of the New York post <laughs> that said my picture and they never even called me. I didn't know I was going to be on. until someone said, Hey, you're on the cover. And it said, Trump prosecutor is Hillary's man. One, two, three, it's really nice. Five words, three mistakes. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> Trump prosecutor, number one, I wasn't prosecuting Trump. That case was charged by the police against Corey Lewandowski. That's error number two. It was charged by police. The prosecutors were not involved at that point. At that point, I had done as much on the Lewandowski case as you had, Debbie. I had done nothing. This was all police driven. Remember, this was in the first half of the show. I hadn't even gone to our office yet. And Hillary's man, I was a contributor to Hillary Clinton previously. But Bill Clinton is Hillary's man, not me. So three mistakes. <laughs> That's so classic. Oh my gosh, I love it. Super interesting. Well, let, you're, you we started talking politics here. Let's just make let's tear off the band aid and, and talk politics. I'm talking to you the week after the elections, and we all watched Florida just go a whole different way than the country did in many ways. And so I'm kind of just going to start with this question about from you as a as a, you know, with your kind of political hat on, a Democrat hat on, what happened in Florida and what do, what do people need to understand about the results Tuesday night? Florida is unique. Uh, this was entirely predictable. Those of us who have a lot of experience in Florida politics 
knew that this was going to be a wipeout. There's an old adage in Tallahassee amongst Florida Republicans when uh, because they usually win elections, even when Florida was dominated by Democrats. Florida Republicans always showed exceptional strength. And their mantra was, we are not the Harlem Globetrotters, but we're always competing against the Washington generals. <laughs> and sadly, yeah, that's party organization is notoriously weak. The uh, fundraising is anemic. The districts are extremely gerrymandered. I mean, in fact, you could say the reason why the Republicans are expected to keep control of Congress or gain control of Congress by a slim majority is because Ron DeSantis did an extreme gerrymander. I mean, he, he blew up the legislative maps that was always that was already gerrymandered, but he took it to a new level that I think will eventually be thrown out by the courts. But the Florida courts, unlike the courts in New York and California, the, the Florida courts said, no, nah, we're going to let these maps go and we'll deal with it after the election. Well, that gave four more seats to the Republicans just by that extreme gerrymandering. And you can do the math, four more seats, that probably is the difference. So uh, the Republicans may owe their majority in the House to Ron DeSantis. Yeah. So yeah, that's and that's their guy for 2024, but he's going to have a problem on his hands. One of my constituents here, a local resident, is going to rip his face off, I think, in the primary, a guy named Donald Trump. He mm. he has a house here on, the, on Palm <laughs> Beach Island and I th- at least that's his plan is uh, he's going to go after DeSantis in a big way. It's going to be an interesting time for sure. Right. But Dave, I mean, the districts were g- extremely gerrymandered, totally get it. A terrible situation. But DeSantis also won statewide by like what, 20 points. I mean, was that a surprise? Should we just assume Florida is no longer a swing state? Is what's, what's happening? Florida is, is not a purple state anymore. It's a red state. And Ron DeSantis uh, becoming governor by 33,000 votes over Andrew Gillum, who was part of the organization previously, that's tiniest of margins. I think it was like 0.4%. That changed the course of history. It launched DeSantis into becoming a presidential candidate, and it moved Florida into the MAGA calm, where he has transformed Florida into a MAGA paradise. He has made us a big part of the culture wars. He has, through his response to COVID and his public statements, have encouraged red voters to move here from blue states. Ironically, by siphoning away a lot of the red voters from swing and blue states, it made other places bluer, but it made Florida much redder. And you see that, for example, in the last four years, we went in Florida from a state that had a Democratic plurality of voters of 200,000. So we had 200,000 more Democrats and Republicans in Florida four years ago to a state today where we have 300,000 more Republicans than Democrats. That's an enormous swing. 500,000 voters in four years to switch or to to, to have that that change. And a lot of our new residents, I shouldn't have said switch, these are new residents in addition just to the ones who have switched from North Florida. And it has transformed Florida because DeSantis has created this idea that it's the free state of Florida. Never mind that you're not allowed to say gay in the classroom. I know the bill doesn't specifically say that, but that's really the intent is to not talk about those issues. Corporations can be fined if they speak out against the governor, ask Disney. You have a new abortion restriction in our state. There's all these new limitations on our freedom that we didn't have before, but the marketing is that it's a free state of Florida and we are a red state. And it's going to stay that way until really smart people like Simon Rosenberg Fernand Amandi and others get together, bring in national minds and national money to help do the hard work from the beginning and, and build this back. The good news is that we're at rock bottom. There's nowhere else to go. We're going to go up. But, you know, our friend Lorraine Osley just lost her reelection in a traditionally blue seat in North Florida in Tallahassee. And that's it. There's like no other blue seats in the Senate up there. And it's just it, it's heartbreaking. And one last thing about that is, is that the way Obama won Florida, he won it two times. He did it because he brought in people nationally to not to take over from the Florida Democratic Party, not to use the local party, but to replace it. And they brought national money. And that's and look what he did. Now we're gonna have to have the same model, but it's going to take time to get it back. Yeah, I, I'm super curious about what you just said about that. I think this is exactly right. Like, and this is true across the country that you guys 
we're the tip of the spear on it, obviously, but this idea that Republicans stand for freedom yet, whether it's book bannings or the abortion issue. I mean, you know, Republicans are doing a boatload of things to restrict freedoms <laughs> across this country, but yet seem to still have this brand of being the party of freedom. I mean, what do you think needs to happen to kind of change that perception in your state? Yeah, book banning. I mean, I forgot about that too. Yeah, book ban- <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot to remember. So for the free state of Florida, there are a lot of things going on that that's uh, less than free. Yeah, so ask the social media companies. The law we pass here says you cannot restrict neo-Nazis from posting on your site. Well, this is a private company. What happened to the free state of Florida, right? Now the government is telling you what you have to say and what you can't say. So uh, that's in the courts, of course. A lot of these laws, these ridiculous laws are held up in the courts. Uh, There was a law that said that a cruise company cannot require vaccinations. Like, really? On a cruise ship? This was the height of the pandemic. That passed the legislature? I didn't know that. Of course. Oh, yeah. The governor gets everything he wants. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. State of Florida. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. So, I mean, what do you, you know, what do you think Democrats are going to have to do, whether it's on the freedom issue or just more broadly? What are Democrats, besides having the national Democrats come in and really take a more active role and, and raise more money and everything else? Is there is there other things that, that you think what should have Democrats been talking about differently or what's going to what's it going to take? I mentioned Simon Rosenberg earlier because not only is he a friend of ours and involved with the New Deal and he uh, is a leader on targeting Hispanic voters on, on messaging and he has thoughts on that about how we can use some of the strategies that are working in other parts of the country in Florida. I mean, in Florida, socialism is a real big deal. And and the Republicans have been really successful in framing Democrats as socialists. I mean, in reality, Joe Biden is one who beat the Democratic socialists in the primary. And yet, you know, we haven't shown up to things. You know, it would be great if we could actually go after those voters who are Venezuelans and others who are non-Cuban Hispanics who should be voting Democratic, but they somehow are they're fed so much misinformation on Spanish language radio that they believe that Democrats are somehow socialist. They don't want socialist dictators, a strong man. Well, there is a person in national politics who resembles a strong man, and it ain't on our side. That's right. That's so right. there's a lot to you just have to go there and, and and you know, Rick Scott, when he ran for US Senate, he was everywhere. He would he visited Puerto Rico like five times. And our guys just, you know, we just think we can have a message of inclusion and healthcare and not show up. No, you got to show up. You got to fight for those, those voters. And you got to go after the other side for their misinformation and push back hard. One reason why we lost two seats in Miami-Dade County two years ago. And again, they stayed red is because when they were calling us socialists, we would laugh it off and then say, no, 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 let's talk about immigration and healthcare. We wait. But the other side is like, wait, wait, you didn't really rebut the socialism thing. So you got to go after these folks. And then you can use the messaging that Simon and others have created for other parts of the country. And that works. But you still have to go show up. And we have not been good about showing up in those communities and fighting for those votes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really just... I emphasize that a lot too, this idea of showing up everywhere. And also kind of inherent in your answer is also this idea, I think that you've got to meet people where they are. Some people have legitimate concerns, right? Because, you know, we we do think some of this stuff is so ridiculous, right? Whether it lets, you know, take critical race theory, just take, take anything. It's ridiculous. It's not taught in schools. This is a red herring. At the at the at the base of it, though, might be for some people. Some people are just trying to cause trouble and are never going to be swayed. But for some people, there might be a legitimate question about what's the appropriate role for parents in the schools, right? I mean, not about critical race theory generally, but, you know, just that that question. And to just kind of like say, I'm not even going to answer that. That's such an absurd question. Of course it is. But to be able to push back and say, that's absurd. But to, to those of you in the middle... Let, let's, let us actually let's talk about what the parents' roles in the schools are, right? Because that we can maybe we can talk to you in a more reasonable way and not just dismiss everybody because because you're parenting a fox talking point. You know what I mean? Debbie, you got it spot on. I love what you said. You've got to meet voters where they are. Don't try to convert them to where you are. Meet them where they are and address their concerns. And when you go in there and using phrase like Latinx or right, did I pronounce it correctly. I've seen polls. One percent of Hispanics prefer to be called Latinx. That's a phrase that white people are using to say, hey, and I'm, and when the other side accuses of being woke, I think it's such an exaggeration. That's like a pejorative phrase. But there are some cultural signals, cues that are bothering people in those swing communities. And when you try to reframe and yeah, I, I, I just think you have to meet them where they are. And and that's a sign of respect, too. So I think we can 
fix this, but it's going to take some time and money. I'm not one of those that says that Florida has gone forever. I think Florida has gone for the next couple or a few cycles, but with enough legwork, we can turn this around. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll have you back on to talk about when Donald Trump and DeSantis both, uh, <laughs> both <laughs> announced their president and what an interesting time we're going to have. But I, but I want to make sure that we have time on this show to get to you a little bit, which is, this is, you know, as you know, called an honorable profession. And the idea is that public service is an honorable profession. And that's something we believe strongly in and that the folks like you doing this work are doing it because it's important and it's life-changing for people. So I would love to just be able to talk for a minute about what got you into public service to begin with. You obviously, talked about your work as a assistant attorney general in the state legislature. Like, did you always, from the time you were a kid, know that government and politics was your, your jam or is this, uh, is this how did it, how did you come to it? <laughs> you know, I, I was a kid and I just had this gene. I just wanted to get involved. And I think it came from my grandfather after whom I'm named passed away before I was born. And my parents are not political, but they saw that it was within me. And I just, it's it's hard to explain. It's just something that I've always taken to. And I grew up as a Democrat, a young Democrat, and then, but a DLCer. And that's why I was so excited when Bill Nelson got me the internship with the DLC in the summer of 93 after I graduated college. And it's so cool to see the people I interned with doing great things. And I still am a believer that the Democratic Party is the, the Big Ten Party part of inclusion. And especially now when you see where the Republican Party is going. And I, I, you know, we need a strong, ethical, center-right party, just that it's lacking now. And I think the Democratic Party is clearly the party that's closest to being centrist than the other party. I know, and I hate when both people, both sides, oh, both sides have their crazy, okay, but our fringe folks are not in control of the party. You know, they're, they're not the ones who are dictating the, the agenda, Joe Biden is the head of our party. And you could say Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. You notice how he didn't say Tlaib or AOC in that conversation. They're not in control. But on the other side, Donald Trump is still the titular head of the Republican Party. More than titular, he is the head of the Republican Party. And, and unfortunately for Governor DeSantis and others, they're going to find that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I, th- I think if there was one major takeaway from the elections last week, it was extremism lost, right? The American people said, even if even if we have misgivings about the Democrats on X, Y, and Z, your party has gone so extreme as a whole that we are not get ready to go there with you, whether it was election denialism or, you know, any th- or choice or other things, right? And they said, um, so, you know, I don't think that means the Democrats have this all figured out. We've got a lot of thinking to do about, I don't like that the most polls show that they think both parties are extreme. <laughs> um, we've, got, we've got to work on our, to your point, like, I don't think that, I think we've got a lot of work to do to remind people that the Democrats are in the mainstream of America and have values that we all share. But I agree with you that essentially extremism was the big loser on Tuesday night. And that gives me some hope for America and maybe some hope for Florida eventually, hopefully. <laughs> well, you know, hey, I, like I said, Florida has been a magnet for the MAGA voters, and that's bad for Florida, but good for the rest of the country, I think. I, I, and remember, these are close elections. So yeah, hopefully, though, we can start making gains again. I, right now, uh, DeSantis is a cult of personality and and we're not, not going to get anywhere while he's governor, but he's going to be leaving soon to run for president. And it will be a Herculean battle between these two figures with big egos. And look, Trump is, is getting in the race. He is going after DeSantis. He correctly believes that he created DeSantis because DeSantis was just a, a an underdog in a Republican primary that very few people had heard of until Donald Trump endorsed him and his endorsement and his active campaigning for DeSantis propelled him to victory. So now Trump is feeling like, Hey, you owe me. And now you're going to run against me. And so you got you got someone like that. Who's very thin skinned and he is taking it personally. Yeah. I I was going to, share with people that you are, um, if they don't know that you have become a real mainstay on a lot of national shows, CNN, MSNBC as a, as a legal analyst, and you're doing such a fantastic job. And I'm so proud of you. You're so fun to watch and you're always so insightful. So I, I think you can answer this question. If you can't, you can tell me, but to your point about we're, we're talking to be transparent on Monday, November 14th, we think we're getting an announcement tomorrow to your point about Donald Trump from your, with your legal hat on is, 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 is this a, is this, I was, I'm always just curious. Is this a real thing that if he is, if he announces he cannot be 
prosecuted because he's a presidential candidate? Is that is that is that is that legally speaking a, a truism? Oh, it's a very real thing in Donald Trump's own mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. It is not real. It is not real in a okay. court of law. It is not real anywhere else. No, it, I predict that Trump will be uh, indicted sometime after the, like I said, after the midterms, I would think, and the midterms aren't over yet because it's still the runoff in December. So I would think just January, post-January. I don't see how Merrick Garland cannot, based on the evidence and the law, other people get indicted for this conduct and do. Even General Petraeus got charged and didn't serve any any jail time, but he got charged, took a plea. And so that's that could be in the future. But regardless, I, I think he will be charged. Now he'll continue to run for president. And I think it's even more likely that he stays in the race while he's indicted because Trump believes that the ability to be president again, or if he's be president again, that could stop him from ever being incarcerated. And, and, and he's probably right about that. That may be his last hope unless a future Republican president pardons him. But he's in a lot of trouble, not just federally, but also at the state level in Georgia, Fannie Willis. And if he's charged there, a federal pardon has no help for him there. So I think he will announce. I think it will not impact whether DOJ indicts him. I think he will be indicted. Whether he ever gets convicted or serves time, I don't know. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I, I took advantage of your of your punditism here on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but Dave, thanks so much for joining us today. It was super interesting and helpful to hear what you're working on and, and just also a lot to think about with Florida going forward. So appreciate your time today. Debbie, thanks for having me. Hope to come back. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.